She teaches at uh, John Jay College, which is part of the City University of New York, where she is chairman of the Community Development. No, the Africana Studies Department. African, African Studies Department. Right. And, um, and professor so, of community justice and social economic development. Okay. So uh, that's Jessica. And um, she's going to tell us about what she's working on now and respond to questions and discussions and whatever emerges over the next hour, hour and a half. So Jessica, Thank you, that's all yours. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Geo Crew. <coughs> Let's see if I can get us a little bit closer there. How's that? Nice. Oops, either way I get somebody else. Oh, I'm in there. There, how about that? Um, so, yeah, the GEO Collective decided I should start us off in this project and that people would be interested in what I'm working on. So hopefully you are, and I guess those of you who signed up are. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Also, thanks to those financial supporters of GEO. We really, really appreciate it and um, hope you continue to support us. And thanks for all those who support us in any way, in all ways that you do. We really appreciate that and helps us to keep going and keep doing these and other innovative, hopefully innovative things that we do. So um, I have, I think, about four major, you know, topics of things that I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Um, so let me list those, and then I'll try to go through one at a time, though you'll see they kind of oh, start to overlap. So worker co-ops and community economic development, which is what I've been working on for, I guess, the past 20 years or so. The solidarity economy and co-ops which also links back into the worker co-ops and community development, and you'll see how in a few minutes. Um, co-ops and community justice, and there's a bunch of ways that those connect to the other two topics. And then co-op learning materials, um, which is also, I think I put out a call to all of you in our um, message about today, because I also want to start talking about how we can get better learning materials out there and who's doing them, who's making them, that kind of thing. So um, I have a passion for worker co-ops, co mostly, mostly because somebody I needs to be on mute. I don't know if it's somebody who just joined us, but I'm hearing a feedback. Sounds better now. Yeah, is it better now? Yes, okay. Um, so, Yes, so I've developed this passion for worker co-ops mostly because um, they help to solve a lot of issues that I grew up, um, my family was a family of social activists and we were always concerned about economic justice as well as social and racial justice. Um, I grew up in a family that believed in, um, in unions and worker rights and worker control and paradigm shifts and revolution and all that kind of thing. And I became an economist trying to figure out how I could understand economics in a way that would help further all those movements and justice practices that I was, that I grew up believing we needed to engage in in the world. And worker co-ops seemed to really be one of those places, one of those structures, patterns that addressed so many of these issues that were a way to address not just economic justice, but racial justice, community ownership, community development, labor rights, that kind of thing. And so as I've gone, and I even was worried about wealth inequality, and of course, worker ownership um, helps to address that too, and we can talk about that more too if you want. So I really began to study worker co-ops. The interesting thing uh, in the 80s when I was getting my PhD in economics, um, I actually wasn't taught anything about co-ops. Um, I would guess I was probably taught a tiny bit about worker ownership in general. And of course we studied Marxism and political economy because I went to UMass Amherst, but we didn't really, learn about co-ops. And so I actually am self-taught in co-op economics. I just started reading and going to conferences and talking to other people and studying with people who knew this stuff and joining research groups that do this work. And um, 
so learned on my own. What I noticed was the sort of hardcore co-op people weren't really doing the rigorous economic work of how the co-ops were really addressing economic justice. They were doing the feel good stuff. You know, generally people are, you know, a little bit more productive and they're happier and they're this and that. Um, but they were a little shoddy on the details um, in general for worker co-ops, but also the whole co-op movement was kind of claiming that co-ops are great and stuff, but we didn't have a lot of details. And so I felt as an economist, I could help to add to the conversation by providing more details, looking at some of the market forces, employment levels, type of employment, productivity, that kind of stuff. But also because I'm an interdisciplinary scholar, I actually start out in literature, African-American literature. Um, I also realized that there are the social aspects, right? Um, the ways that co-ops develop social capital and leadership and the ways that co-op deliver a lot of non, what we would call in economics, non-market benefits. And that's sort of the leadership, the social development, the anti-exploitation, that kind of stuff. So I tried to start working with people who are interested in that broader understanding of economic justice through cooperatives and through worker cooperatives. Um, and then I noticed that we were still not focusing on all of the sort of solidarity values that some of us care about. So you could still have co-ops, not always in the worker co-op field, sometimes more in the other co-ops, the food co-ops and the ag co-ops, where you treat your workers horribly, but you're a co-op. So then trying to make those connections. So how can you be a co-op in what we would call the solidarity movement, um, which means you have to be more than a co-op. So some of the work I started doing, and actually a lot of it with my GEO colleagues and the Solidarity Economy Network colleagues was connecting those solidarity values of non-exploitation, um, anti-oppression, uh, understanding gifting and multiple forms of uh, invisible economic activity, that kind of thing, and bringing that into the mix also. So trying to understand the ways that co-ops, but especially worker co-ops, connect people and all those different kinds of levels and combine fair trade and uh, sustainability and uh, green jobs with democratic workplaces and collective ownership and democratic control of, of work and that kind of stuff. So bringing all those pieces together, which then of course makes everything 10 times more complicated. And I know at least in this age of Trump, everybody's trying to uncomplicate things and right, simplify, but you can't really understand this stuff without complication. Um, so uh, I ended up complicating the, the explorations and the study when I was trying to actually make it more concrete for people to really understand and be able to talk about all the different ways that co-ops can be important community development strategies and strategies for economic liberation. So I'm still struggling with that sort of how do we still keep all those intersectionalities and complications, but not make them seem so complicated. And I, you know, that's something I hopefully maybe some of you want to talk to me about because I'm still struggling with, so how do we talk about these things, but get into those kinds of details, in-depth analysis, but still not lose people. And also how to talk, some people in the co-op world still don't really want to talk about solidarity economics, right? Um, I have a couple of friends who are really like, they don't even want to talk about worker ownership without talking about the Mondragon principles of worker ownership and worker co-ops, because those are different from the ICA seven international co-op principles, because the Mondragon principles add a lot more about worker solidarity and community change and that kind of thing. Um, and yet you have people who are very hesitant to add those other pieces. You know, there's arguments even at the ICA, sorry, the International Cooperative Alliance movement, right? They're even struggling with whether to add things about environmental sustainability. Some people think, what is it, the sixth principle of uh, concern for community encapsulates environmental sustainability. And some people think we need an eighth principle that actually says it right out, right? So nobody can gloss over it. 
So these are a lot of the debates that I somehow end up either learning about or being in the middle of or contributing to um, out there in the field, especially as we're talking about worker co-ops and community economic development. The other thing that's been interesting, I guess since the 90s, there seems to be a movement of using worker co-ops to alleviate poverty. And so a lot of the research I started doing about um, benefits and impacts of cooperatives on the communities was also trying to help address that specific issue, right? How are, we, how are co-ops helping people to get out of poverty? Is it just because most worker co-ops try to pay their members work, living wages? Or is it because as a member of a worker co-op, you actually own a business and usually, hopefully, it's a thriving business, especially if it's lasted more than five years, it's usually um, thriving or at least breaking even. Um, or what other ways are, are, are the co-ops getting people out of poverty? That's also been a discussion because of the whole movement from the 80s, I guess it was, of the micro enterprise movement. A lot of people um, conflate and mix up co-ops and micro enterprises. Now, some co-ops are small, so they're micro enterprises, but micro enterprises are still capitalist, sole proprietor businesses most of the time. And so the notion of do you just need people to own a little bit, to own their own business, no matter how small it is, or do we need people owning a business that really is going to help them build skills, deliver something sustainable, and get them out of poverty? A lot of those micro enterprises that people went crazy over were still not getting people out of poverty. They might have been making 10000 a year instead of 1000 a year, so it was better than starving but it wasn't really pulling people out of poverty and it was kind of pimping on that. Um, so those questions have come up. And in fact, I just was invited to a meeting that I can't go to in Nairobi uh, that the UN is putting together because they really want to hear actually from people of color now about co-ops and anti-poverty measures for co-ops. So they're having a meeting, can't remember now, March or sometime, where they're convening people from around the world to try to talk about how people of color in the co-op movement are pushing and can help us think about co-ops as an anti-poverty movement. So I'm really upset that I can't attend that meeting, but I'm really excited that the UN is moving in that direction and really trying to work in that direction. Um, so I think I already just mixed the worker co-ops, community development, solidarity economy stuff. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, that's one of the questions you can ask. I'm going to keep moving unless, Cadwell, do you have any questions yet? No, I don't. But please feel free to raise your hand in the chat if you want your question answered. I'm trying to get that question. Great. Oh, okay. There is a question. Yes. The question is, are there serious incompatibilities between the cooperative movement and the solidarity movement? So the question is, are there serious incompatibilities between the solidarity movement and the cooperative movement? Yes. Um, e yes, how about that? Um, <laughs> I hesitate to say yes, because there shouldn't be, but there are. And I guess it's, it's on both sides. So the solidarity economy movement, I've noticed, can sometimes be a little bit rigid that they really uh, want only sort of anti-neoliberalism, uh, anti-capitalist projects counted as solidarity economy, right? That the solidarity economy movement is really supposed to be anti-neoliberalism, anti-capitalism, and that if you're not really creating an alternative to capitalism or being anti-capitalist, then you're not part of the solidarity economy in which case there's lots of co-ops that aren't explicitly anti-capitalist. Um, they're not exactly operating in a capitalist way, but they are operating in capitalist markets. But a lot of co-ops, especially worker co-ops and actually ag co-ops and stuff, they're not actually trying to change the system or even topple neoliberalism. They're just trying to survive in whatever economic atmosphere they're in. And so there is that tension there. Um, as I said, there's often a tension, especially in ag co-ops and worker co-ops, sorry, ag co-ops and food co-ops about how you treat your workers. Um, and for a solidarity economy movement, 
how you treat your workers is a huge piece. And if you don't treat your workers well, then you're not in the solidarity movement, but you're still a co-op. So that's why, you know, a lot of us are now starting to talk about solidarity co-ops or co-ops in the solidarity movement. And then which side was that? That was the solidarity side, right? On the co-op side, is that right? Do they answer about the solidarity movement? On the co-op side, there can also be tensions because I guess I just said it, some of the co-ops are really more worried about finding a way to compete in the market and being in the, successful in the market and doing that with a collective, but not necessarily being against or anti the market forces or anti neoliberalism. And then as we said, some co-ops don't have a mission about how they treat their workers, right? So ag co-ops, there's nothing about being an agricultural co-op that has anything to do with treat, how you treat your agricultural workers or your, help, your hired help. Um, and I've been in food co-ops where there have been raging debates about whether workers, what kind of rights the workers have, whether we can afford to pay the workers a living wage, whether workers should be on the board of a food co-op. Um, and again, that's not solidarity. So if they we're going to force them to have a solidarity lens or be part of the solidarity movement, there would be a huge debate and upheaval, I guess, in certain co-op circles. Yet the growing co-op movement, at least in the United States, is moving more and more towards more grassroots democratic participation, that kind of thing. But it's not, it's not there automatically. So I think, um, I think there's a subset of us, you know, if you take those Venn diagrams, right, there's a subset of us where all the pieces fit, we're in the middle of all the pieces intersecting, but there's a bunch of existing co-ops, groups of people, movements and stuff that would be on the side where there's no intersection or there's only intersection with one part. Um, I don't know what we do about that. That could be something we might want to talk about with the people who are on to the chat today is either whether we need to bring those groups together or how we form a group that recognizes the intersections that we want to recognize. But I would say it's not automatic that all these groups match up. I think when I first started joining them, I thought it was automatically, we're all sort of doing the same thing, but I realized the more I've learned um, that we're not always, only some subset of us are doing, have the same set of values and include all the values together. So I hope that answers that question. Um, let me move on, you know, since I joined John Jay actually 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago now, um, I've added this sort of community justice side to my work um, as an activist and an academic. Um, and what I've been finding is that the traditional community justice work is more about community policing, having community courts, um, working within the criminal justice system or the criminal injustice system um, to make things a little bit more just to involve community a little bit more um, oversight of policing, you know, police being more involved in community and have walking a beat again, like the old days, uh, sentencing circles, right? Getting community and people who are the victims involved in agreeing to the sentences, those kinds of things. But when I actually first started thinking about this, I was working at the Children's Defense Fund and in the Black Community Crusade for Children, this would have been, I guess, in the early 90s, we were doing that. Um, Marion Wright Edelman, the founder and head of that, was talking about five starts that children needed, a healthy start, a safe start, a, I don't even remember what the other three were. But anyway, the safe start one was the one everybody had trouble with because at first, they were just thinking of it as, you know, free from violence. But then when they thought about how the safe start connected to the healthy start and whatever the other starts were, um, I said, you know, it's really about safe communities, right? Safe and healthy communities and the well-being of communities. And how do we get that? That's back to community economic development and solidarity economic development. So when, by the time I got to John Jay, I was able to articulate this notion of community justice about more than just what's happening in the injustice system, but what's happening in communities. How is, how is community stability, economic stability, economic justice, how do those all relate to public safety and community ownership and control 
especially through co-ops, but other solidarity economy mechanisms, how does that help communities to protect and make themselves safe? And how does that interface with um, protections against state violence, right? Because a lot of safety, you know, what most people want to think about crime as one-on-one -on -one crime on the street, right? But really, so much of our criminal and justice system is about state violence and about pitting people who have nothing against each other and having them fight, duke it out so that those who have can keep, you know, keep going. And so I have started talking about community justice in the sense of how do we really make communities, community well-being, community controlled, enterprises at the community level, the grassroots level, where people are working together to solve all kinds of problems, both economic, social, safety problems, and what would that look like? And so some of it, again, is still doing community policing and community courts, but a lot of it is doing solidarity economy development and getting people more control over their own economy, making sure everybody has work, meaningful work that they're in control of, that pays them a living wage, that gives them a dividend on, on surplus, um, people working together to make sure their communities that nobody's left behind, nobody's poor and hurt and homeless and unsheltered and unfed in their communities. And again, using solidarity economics for that. So, you know, I've started teaching courses on that and started um, talking to groups like Movement for Black Lives who have in their platform the economic justice and using co-ops and solidarity economy to promote, right, what's the world we want. So it's not just that we need to stop police brutality and state violence, but we need to create a new, better world where we can control things in a way that we don't either need those outside authorities or where we have the world uh, developing and serving its people in the way that uh, reduces most of the crime and unsafety that we have. Um, so that's sort of the broad contours of that. I've focused a lot of my work right now on incarcerated and returning citizens. I got very excited when I heard about a model in Puerto Rico where incarcerated um, workers own their own co-ops. And I've been trying to bring that to the United States. It's a really slow process, um, partly because I don't have any funding. It's also partly because the U.S. is so archaic. So even though Puerto Rico is in officially in the U.S., this is through state, basically state laws that they can enact as a commonwealth partner. Um, so bringing that to the U.S. has been really difficult. But the notion there is to look and see how incarcerated people can make life a little bit better behind bars, which is now like the worst place to be, right? Um, how you can create a business, own it with your fellow inmates, uh, use it to humanize your life a little bit, as well as to connect back with your family, because now you can make an income that you can share with your family, as well as work with other people and use your energy and, um, uh, and social capital. Uh, to help build something and build it with other people in your same situation and help everybody's family, that kind of thing. The specifics, I guess, I'm assuming everyone knows some of that work already that I've done, but I'll tell you the specifics. There's one co-op, the oldest one um, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's about 12, 13 years old now. Uh, Cooperative Aragos. It's an artist cooperative. Uh, inside, uh, I always forget the name of the prison, outside of San Juan, a male, medium uh, security male prison. And what they were able to do was to create a worker co-op, to create their art and sell it. They've had a huge amount of support from uh, the League of Cooperatives, the Puerto Rican League of Cooperatives and the other co-ops in Puerto Rico. So they, the, the league sent them a co-op educator. Actually, they demanded a co-op educator when they realized they wanted to become a co-op, not just a, a for-profit business. Um, the league has sent them a co-op educator. Uh, they were able to have a meeting with the governor at the time. This was 14 years ago because they realized that the co-op laws in Puerto Rico, and I think they're pretty much the same in the U.S., 
don't allow you to be an owner or on the board of a co-op if you're incarcerated. So they actually met with the governor who agreed with them that the law should be changed and got them involved with the state assembly. And the state assembly eventually changed the law so that they could be incarcerated and own their own co-op. They didn't want outsiders to own the co-op and employ them. They wanted to own their own co-op and run it themselves. And so that's what they were able to do. They won the law change so that they could then do that. So then they ran their own artist cooperative. They have laws and policies about if you're a parent, some of your earnings every year have to go back to your family. Um, they have agreements with the prison 15% of their revenues have to go back to the prison because they rent space and computers from the prison in order to run their business. They also have another agreement with the prison to go out. The co-op community invites them to co-op AGMs, annual general meetings, and other co-op conferences to sell their work. And so they have an agreement that they pay all the expenses, take two guards with them, and send two of their people out there they have process for how they pick who can be the face their face out in the world and sell the work for them that kind of thing so it's a really well honed process um and they've been able to uh, do a lot um 50 at least 50 of the members have already gotten uh, their sentences diminished because of the good work they did as co-op members and have been gotten gone out and been uh, are on parole or out of prison now um, recidivism rate only two of them went back and one is already out again so they have a really low recidivism rate so all the issues that one could say could be a problem with doing this have pretty much don't exist in that example um, there's three others three or four others that have been starting up in Puerto Rico similar there's a women's, uh, in one of the women's prison, that one apparently has been really hard. Apparently they treat the women prisoners even worse than men in men prison. So that it's been much harder for them to get organized. They, ha they had a business plan to have a bakery and then the corrections office took that business plan and started a bakery themselves. So they had to start all over and they decided to do a sewing co-op and they got sewing machines donated. And then just as they were about to launch, half of their members got transferred to another prison. The woman they elected president got put in solitary. So it was hard for her to attend meetings. So they actually had to petition to get her two extra hours out of solitary a week so she could attend co-op meetings. So anyway, you see they, they have lots of problems. And every time a prison officer changes, or at least the higher ups change, they have to renegotiate all the MOUs and that kind of thing. But anyway, it's working. It's a great model. We've been talking about it here in the US for a while, and we're still working. I've got a group that's working. We're working on the research, trying to figure out how to make this work, who would fund this kind of work, and then what state laws exist, need to be changed, or exist that would allow this level of co-op development. So that's like really exciting. Um, what's happening even faster in the US though is co-ops for uh, returning citizens, worker co-ops returning citizens. There's a lot of groups, um, Maryland, LA, Massachusetts that have already started working with returning citizens to create their own or to be part of a worker co-op. Um, and that looks really promising. There's a lot less hurdles, um, but there's still a lot of um, a lot of pieces to work out. Incarcerated citizens need a lot of support systems. So trying to figure out the relationship of a worker co-op to the support systems has been a challenge. How fast does the worker co-op get uh, start up and get breaking even so it can really be giving living wages and really providing the kind of support and stability that's needed. All those questions we're still working on. Um, and then how to train how to teach co-op economics to people. I'm trying to do it while they're still in prison. So when they come out, they're ready to jump into a co-op, but also while they're in prison, we might be able to figure out how they can own their own co-op. So the education piece is um, the part I was gonna end on, right? Yeah. So getting to that in a minute, but those are some of the hurdles for that. But there's actually a lot of good energy around thinking about this. I don't know if all of you know, but um, I think it was from Obama, there's been a 
changes in policies and a lot of people who got three strikes are out and mandatory minimums in the 90s and 2000s are now coming out in the next few years. So a lot of people who work in this area realize they need to figure out something to do with returning citizens. So there's a growing interest in trying to figure this out um, and figure out where to go with that. Uh, Cadwell, how are we doing or should I do my education piece and then open it back up? You keep going. Okay. No questions. We have a couple oh, of questions wait, in I've, the chat. I'm not sure Ken will see the questions. I'm being chat. fed some more questions. I'm not seeing them. You're not seeing them? Okay. Um, so we'll do them here. Yes. How successful have your efforts to promote a larger picture of community? How successful have your efforts been to promote a larger picture of community justice? How successful have my efforts been, oh, to promote this larger vision of community justice? Um, not very successful, but partly it's my own fault. I haven't really had a, had time. I haven't done a lot of presentations on it and I haven't written anything formally about it, which at least in my world as an academic is the way that I get a lot of this information out. So partly I haven't really articulated it well enough. I think that's probably should be sort of either my new year's resolution or my next five year plan is to really make sure I figure out how to write about it. And when people invite me to speak, decide to speak about that more. Um, I am teaching, again, I had taught it a community justice course a couple of years ago, and now it's actually a part of a new major that we have at, at John Jay, so I'll be teaching it more. Um, so I think it also, for me, it helps to teach it so then I can figure out how, to, how it help what people need to know and how to help people understand it. Um, the other thing is I think there's some resistance because unfortunately in our criminal injustice system, part of the problem is how connected it is to racial, race, racism and racial inequality and how connected it is to this notion of the undeserving poor or the undeserving, right? And so as long as we keep thinking that crime and justice are about individuals doing horrible things to each other and not seeing the bigger picture of uh, structural racism and structural state violence. We don't really understand, right? You don't understand all the pieces for why the broader vision of community justice is needed. So that's the other problem is how do you do that education about, again, these deeper complexities when people just want simplicity Right, so that's what I'm struggling with. Um, if people have ideas, um, and I will get to one of my ideas about how to do complexity with simplicity, which is to do, you start doing graphic novels. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but otherwise, I'm not sure how we're gonna move toward this broader notion, except I've been excited, as I said, by people like the Movement for Black Lives is interested in that broader notion. Um, even remember Occupy, Wall Street, they were interested in that broader notion when they started thinking about what we could do um, in economic justice, but um, they saw it broader as, as well. So I think we're slowly getting there, but we're gonna need, uh, I think, a new cadre of people who can talk about this. Hopefully some of them will come from John Jay, will be John Jay students that have come through my stuff, but we need a lot more than just that. Is there a second? Question. Yes. Um, how is teaching co-op economics different from teaching mainstream mainstream economics or even political economics that ignore co-ops? How is cooperative economics different from teaching mainstream economics or even political economy? I guess that's what the mm -hmm. question is. Um, great questions. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, it's different in a couple of ways. First of all, mainstream economics, and I'm gonna to try to, uh, this is probably a two hour lecture, so I'm gonna to try to do it in five minutes. <laughs> um, mainstream economics is actually a very rigid field of study. There are a huge number of assumptions. They've tried to make it into like a physical science where there's the rules of gravity or whatever, and if you don't follow those rules, then nothing works, right? Which is not true, but that's how it's taught and that's how it exists. So there's all these assumptions about every economic agent being 
doing and acting rationally the same way as any other economic agent as long as they make the same income and something else, right? There's all these notions about, right, supply and demand. That is, if you have more demand, then the price goes up. If you have more supply, the price goes down, which isn't really true either, especially because most of, most of prices are determined by monopolies. Um, but anyway, so you have all those kinds of rigid rules that get taught in mainstream economics that have nothing to do with all the stuff we're talking about now. Mainstream economics doesn't, I mean, they, ca they might care about how many people in your family, but they don't actually care about anything else like identity, race, gender, right? They don't believe in inequality because inequality isn't rational. Um, and so it's hard to have any of these kind of conversations in mainstream economics. And when it's taught, you're really teaching all these canons about this rigidity to, you know, to justify that invisible hand thing about to justify that the economy, you know, sorts itself out and comes to the right equilibrium because of all these stupid assumptions. So you can't really talk about it. I mean, sometimes I have tried to put it in there in a mainstream course, but that's also why I teach in Africana studies and not in economics, because I can't really stand to teach all that stuff. Um, uh, how is it different from, what was the other part? The mainstream economics and- Political economy. Oh, political and, economy. And so, fields that ignore co-ops. And fields yeah. that ignore, right. So even political economy often ignores co-ops because in the, the standard political economy is really um, a critique of capitalism, but it's not a study of solidarity economics, if you can understand what I mean by that. So political economy uh, is really the pre, is really what, the, is the economic thought that Marx comes out of. And so Marxism is part of political economy. And what's different about political economy from mainstream economy is political economy understands that there are politics, power relationships, inequalities, and uh, existing uh, inequalities that get in the way of the perfect markets working the way the traditional economics thinks, right? So political economy is about broadening, seeing economics as a social science rather than a natural science. So there are no natural laws. It's all about human relationships and how people relate, who has power, who doesn't, how people gain their power, recognizing that, connecting political analysis with economic analyses. So it's the tool that helps us to get to solidarity economics, but it doesn't necessarily go all the way down to worrying about grassroots economic development and co-op development. Now, political economists are more likely to look at co-ops and worker ownership and labor unions and labor power and that kind of thing, but they don't automatically do it. So I actually studied political economy. That was my field uh, that I got my PhD in, um, but we still didn't study cooperatives. Um, now, actually, they do. UMass actually has a certificate in cooperative economics now in their economics department. But when I was there, they didn't have it. The, the political economists who were there didn't see, see community economics and cooperatives as a necessary subfield. Now, luckily, it's gotten more play, but, we, but still a lot of places don't teach it. Business schools right? I think 98% of business schools don't teach this stuff either, either, even though cooperative economics is a viable business model. They ignore it because, again, most business schools are still teaching traditional. They barely even teach political economy, let alone, you know, let alone cooperatives. So it's kind of a pecking order. Um, when I was teaching myself cooperative economics, the only places that were actually teaching it that I could find were some of the progressive business schools, but there were very few of them. And mostly, again, it was communities of people teaching ourselves, or you have to go to the Europeans or the Canadians who are ahead of us on teaching and learning this stuff. So um, there's very few places in U.S. academia where you can get a solid course on community economics, cooperative, solidarity economy, except slowly 
there's more and more of us in the field who are teaching it somehow, somewhere, some way. Um, and so the co-op economics part and the solidarity economics, solidarity economics part is about teaching people about human agency, about uh, social economic development, right? Human beings taking charge of their own economic development, understanding and making visible, invisible work like childcare and home care um, and other invisible actions, uh, bartering, right? So when we try to teach those kinds of things, none of that is really in the economics canon, but it's in this, what, we, what I call community economics canon. Um, but there aren't really any real textbooks or, you know, most of us weren't trained in school about this. It's learning it through talking with other people, you know, going to the social forums, going to co-op research meetings, reading other people's work, uh, thinking it through together, trying to write stuff about it, and then trying to work with students on how to think about it. And the funny thing is students are much more interested in that than they are in traditional economics. This stuff really resonates to them and they can see, you know, the bartering and the other stuff happening in their communities. Um, you know, solidarity economics and cooperative economics also talks about, you know, it's much more empowering, right? Uh, after I got my PhD in economics, I used to say, you know, we, it's, the, it's that I understand now why it's called the dismal science because all anybody talks about is what's wrong, right? What people can't do, what the economy isn't doing, what's going wrong. Um, and I wanted to study what economics could do. And so again, finding solidarity economics cooperatives was a way for me to look at possibilities and, um, and ways that people were actually overcoming the barriers and the oppressions of capitalism and doing something different and new and better um, and making something work that wasn't the way everybody else was doing it or the way you were supposed to do it. Um, and that's really empowering when you talk to people. That's why I'm hoping we can start teaching it in prisons because just even if they never start a co-op, talking about and thinking about how you can be in control of your own economy, right? How you can think of a being somebody who can create well-being for yourself and your community without exploiting other people, without having to exploit other people to do it, using other people in a way that's collective and collaborative so that everybody gains, right? Teaching that is just invaluable for life, right? It changes how we think about life, how we see ourselves in the world, how we think about change and transformation and empowerment and agency. Um, and, you know, yet we barely do it. Um, and, you know, we could go into a million reasons why we don't teach that way, but um, that's the part that excites me about economics and we can talk about it in that way and not just talk about, you know, the high unemployment rates or the, the, the Wall Street stock market debacles and that kind of thing, but really talk about what people, human beings are doing to help themselves, their families and their neighbors and how that's changing their neighborhood, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, Got a question from Ty. Okay. Excellent. Um, one of your white papers on the benefits of cooperatives points to data from the World Council of Credit Unions. It says that 90% of cooperative businesses are still operating after five years. Are there certain worker co-ops that are more or less likely to experience this success? And then another one, what are some of the financial accounting problems that cooperatives deal with? And before we answer those questions, a quick reminder to Anyone who wants to ask a question can put it into the Zoom chat. There is also an icon uh, on your screen uh, that will allow you to virtually raise your hand so we could call on you. So either questions into the chat or using the hand raising function. Uh, sorry to interrupt, please go ahead, Jessica. Okay, I'm trying to remember the questions. The first one was about why the, why the, how they're successful, right? why the longevity? Cadwell, was that the first question? The longevity okay. of co-ops from the World Council of Credit Unions, and then they wanted to know why I thought the successful ones were successful? It says that 90% of cooperative businesses are still operating after five years. Are there certain worker co-ops that are more or less likely to experience their success? Okay. So, yes. Obviously, there's still 10% or so that don't succeed in um, 
and obviously some don't succeed after five years or whatever, the thing that was so important about that study was first of all that that's a much higher success rate than small businesses in general. Because most people think of co-ops, especially worker co-ops, as being precarious and not lasting long. Um, when actually they last longer than most small businesses and some of the reasons in general, and then I'll get to the worker co-op examples, some of the reasons in general that co-ops last longer is because it's collective, right? Two heads better than one kind of thing, right? You have more people, you're uh, spreading the risk among more people, you're spreading the knowledge and genius. There's more knowledge and genius because you have more people involved. It takes more, right? More support from families, communities to start up a co-op. There's so much more education that goes into running your own co-op and that you need to know so people are much more educated when they go into the business. Um, that kind of thing. Often co-ops, especially now worker co-ops, are considered much more productive than other businesses because the work, that motivation of being your own, you know, owning your business is in addition to controlling, running it and stuff. So you get the benefits on both sides from, uh, uh, from running it together and also being a part owner of it. So your productivity goes up and productivity always helps. The other thing, especially for worker co-ops, but really any of the co-ops, um, if you have a good business plan, you're more likely to succeed. Um, if you're in a growing market or in a place where uh, the product or the economic activity that you're doing is really needed um, and that you can grab that share of the market or connect to that thing for the worker co-ops and also I guess food co-ops which food some food co-ops are struggling now in low-income communities but if you can find that niche right provide things that people need um, that they're not getting somewhere else. If you can do that marketing where they understand this is a community-based business that's trying to give back to the community that's owned by community members, that helps. Some of the inner city co-ops I studied, it was simple things like everybody knew it was community members who owned it, so they didn't rob it, right? They didn't throw a rock in the window. They didn't steal the carts and you have to replace them, right? So you save money because you were seen as a member of the community and people embrace that and try to support you. Didn't always work, but sometimes. Um, but I think more that, you know, the, the pro high productivity and that solidarity in the sense of that you've got a bunch of people working on this together to make it work. So if you have somebody who's in trouble one year, right? If they were a sole proprietor, theirs would probably, their business would probably go under. But if they're a member of a co-op, they've got three, five, 10 other people who can kind of fill in a little bit or help. There was a, um, it's not exactly a co-op, but an ASUSU, which are, uh, those are uh, revolving loan funds among uh, people who know each other well. There's a really interesting one in Atlanta that does um, home ownership. So all the members put in a huge amount of money, which is about $500 a month toward a down payment to buy a home. And every three or four months, there's enough money in the coffer to give one of the members like $100,000 for a down payment on a home. So it's a huge commitment. One of the stories they told me is that um, during the Great Recession, one of their families, actually it was a couple, so they were both putting in 500 a month to try to get faster to home ownership. They both lost their jobs. And they came to the next meeting and they're like, we got to drop out. We don't know what to do. And you know, the rest of the group started referring people to them. They got consultant money, whatever. They were able to stay in and continue their payments um, because the rest of the group made that commitment to them, gave them ideas for how they could make money and go into business for themselves or whatever, and also supported them and referred people to them, that kind of thing. So if you think about that level of solidarity support, in any other kind of even business relationship, you can see how the, the, the worker co-ops can be successful. That said, we also unfortunately have um, disasters <laughs> where it doesn't work. Even with all that going for them, it doesn't work. Sometimes the economy just pans. Sometimes the business plan didn't quite anticipate properly or wasn't the right thing at the right time. Sometimes, um, you know, the forces, the economic forces and conditions just aren't there 
um, to make it work. Um, but as we said, that tends to be more rare than for a regular small business development. So one of the things I tried to point out in that paper and other places is um, that co-ops are really the opposite. So many people think they're more risky and more precarious, but actually they're not. It's really risky to do micro enterprise and small business development. Um, financial challenges, that was the other question, right? Yes, um, financial accounting problems that cooperatives deal with. Right, so this I actually don't know as much about, so maybe if somebody on the line wants to chime in, but I can tell you a little bit. Um, capitalization is a huge problem for any small business and also for co-ops, and sometimes it's harder for co-ops because most banks and financial institutions don't understand cooperative ownership and they depend on one person putting, giving collateral for a loan and a certain kind of business plan. Even credit unions who want to loan to co-ops and especially worker co-ops have had this problem because their underwriters and their fed, federal regulators won't accept if they take, if they give loans that without the individual collateral, that kind of thing. So like um, Lower East Side Credit Union about 10 years ago had to get a waiver from the feds, uh, the National Credit Union Administration. They had to get a it's waiver from them. Oh, it is five o'clock. They had to get a waiver from them in order to actually accept, uh, to give out certain loans to worker co-ops and other community owned businesses that they wanted to support in their area. Um, so that's a huge problem. Where do you get the loans? Where do you get underwriting? Where do you get line of credit? Um, where do you get the startup funds? Because often, again, co-ops do have longer startup periods because they're putting so many social and economic things together, right? So you need time to train people, et cetera, before you can break even, sometimes before you even open your doors. And so often, especially in the 21st century, co-ops are looking for startup money, grants, and that kind of thing. So where do you find it? who understands the model you're using, and then whether the financial world, right, understands worker ownership and collective ownership, often they don't. And so I would say those are the worst hurdles. Um, another thing, and then as I said, hopefully maybe somebody else can answer that, but another piece of the financial accounting that I would say is difficult is most co-ops, especially worker co-ops, operate under open book management, which means everybody in the co-op, or at least everybody on the board, has to understand how to read a spreadsheet, how to understand an income and expense statement. They have to be part of the budgeting process, have to understand the accounting, which makes total sense because that's again part of the democratizing of capital, the democratizing of the association, right? Everybody needs to have the same information if you're gonna be voting on what the business does. Um, but getting people to that level where they're comfortable with numbers, especially again in this world where we make people feel like math and numbers and business is out of most of our abilities um, when actually all of us can understand and can do it. Right, but we're, we're, we tend to be taught that we shouldn't or can't do it or whatever. So how you bring everybody to that level so they can e everyone can equally understand the financing and the finances and the financial reporting of the organization and make financial decisions on an equal par with everybody else is really difficult. And sometimes you end up with the finance gurus kind of making all the decisions and doing everything and everybody else kind of just trusting right and leaving it to other people and that's not really how it should work especially not a worker co-op it's another reason why i like worker co-op so much because really everybody should be on par with all the information and that's another way to increase financial literacy and other kinds of literacy is by making sure people know all that in their own business and their own co-op um i just wanted to finish one other piece and then we'll fin you know we have a half an hour to uh, for more questions i wanted to talk more about co-op education materials. The other thing I hear when I go around the country speaking is that there aren't good co-op education materials for young people, for people of color, especially for African Americans. Um, they don't see themselves in the videos. The example, there's not examples given. Um, the whole history of cooperatives is supposed to have started with the Rochdale pioneers in Britain. Um, 
without even a real understanding of what the Roche del Pioneers did and were, because they were really much more revolutionary than you hear about. But aside from that, you know, ancient African cultures, ancient Aboriginal cultures, and First Nation cultures were all doing co-op economics and solidarity economics, solidarity economics, but it's not in any of the materials. They don't go back and talk to you about um, what ancient Africa, some of the ancient African societies did, or what uh, the Al Qaeda uh, groups in Mexico did in the 1200s or whatever. Um, and they don't even talk about, you know, uh, what did I find? What 50 or 40 different African American leaders throughout our history here in the US who are promoting co ops? You never hear about their notions of cooperatives or how they were talking about cooperatives, mutual aid societies, which came before we even had incorporated laws to incorporate co ops, but we were practicing mutual aid, which is basically. Um, cooperative economics or at least mutual insurance kind of relationships. So we don't have good materials on that. We don't have good materials with faces of young people, people of color, women, right? We don't have good materials about women asserting leadership and a feminist economics perspective on leadership and social economic development. Um, we don't have good documentaries or films or film clips on this. Um, so that's another one of my pet peeves. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, that uh, today and other times we can talk more about how and who is creating the good materials, right? We need materials in French and Spanish, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, and then we need relevant materials. So that's why I'm trying to uh, create a graphic novel version of my book, Collective Courage, on the history of African-American cooperatives. Um, and I actually, we've got about 15 20 pages of it done. So I'm really excited because I mean, it's actually really happening. I was thinking maybe instead of waiting for the whole book, I should be doing volume, right? Volume one, the first 20 pages or something like they do with some of the comic books, right? Mm. And then you could put out a whole volume of all the pieces later or something. But anyway, um, so you can ask me more about that, but I'm excited because to me that's, um, I mean, the, the book already got more publicity and more interest than I ever imagined it would, but I still think there's an audience, middle school, high school, even some college students who would resonate and learn it better through the graphic novel way rather than having to slog through um, the academic research I did. So also thinking about different ways. I would love once I finish that book to think about other comic books or graphic novels we could do to teach cooperative economics, um, children's books, right? But again, there's some of that existing, but a lot of it is not for African-Americans. Um, you know, the Puerto Ricans have some good stuff in Spanish. So do the Mexicans and South Americans. We, I don't know why they're not in the US more, but anyway, trying to figure out how to pull together what is existing and then figure out where the gaps are and what else we could be creating, I think is another important strategy that we have. Um, but I'm really excited about the graphic novel because it's a new, it's a whole new way of thinking for me. Um, in fact, the first 10 pages or so, I kept saying, oh, we have to put this in, we have to put that in. And I was like, oh no, this is a graphic novel, right? Sometimes you just can't say everything or have a picture, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to get your mind in a whole different mindset. I have a couple people working on some films, black co-op films, but they can't get funding. So that's the next also strategy where to find funding for this stuff. But I'm excited about what's out there. Um, people seem more and more interested. And um, I think we're really moving forward and I'm excited to be moving forward with everybody. Great. No we have more questions. Oh no, no more questions. <laughs> yeah, we have one. We have one oh, by yeah. Matt Crop. Okay. I'm gonna unmute him so he can ask the question himself. Okay. All right. Hey. Um, so I I work in the employee ownership world, and I was curious to get your thoughts on um, kind of what I feel like is one of the sort of biggest tension in that umbrella. Um, so I, I sort of see there being two dominant frames for, for that, you know, shared capitalism, which is, you know, the ESOP is the dominant form and then work, you know, economic democracy, which the worker co-op is the dominant form. So I was, I was curious if you had thoughts on um, the ways that worker co-op should be both in 
collaboration and conflict with um, shared capitalism, which is the sort of probably, you know, economically more powerful of the two, but they kind of sort of exist with some similar goals and some different goals. Right. Yeah. Good question. Thanks. Um, so I'm clearly, I think it's clear that I'm in the camp of the democratic participation, grassroots ownership, worker control um, camp. And the reasons why I'm more excited and put more of my energy into that than shared capitalism is pretty much for all the stuff we just spent the last hour talking about, but I'll, I'll revamp it. I really believe that the only way we're, really, we're gonna achieve real economic and social justice is people owning and controlling their own non-hierarchical, non-exploitative economic activity. And to me, that's owning it as a group of people, as a community, in a way where people have a voice about the work itself, how the work is compensated, how the company is run or the enterprise is run. Um, so people are in control of all the pieces, all the facets. Shared capital, to me, is really not about that level of economic participation. It's more about dividing up the ownership so that it's affordable, right? And so more people can have the ownership, but it's not necessarily about making sure that everybody has voice, that community, family, and each member really prosper. Um, it's kind of giving up on let's change capitalism. It's kind of like, let's just get our piece of the pie. I mean, I know some shared capital feel like they're changing capitalism, but to me, it's more about, right, let's, if we can get a piece of the pie and more of us can get a piece of the pie, that'll kind of fix capitalism a little bit or mediate how bad it is. Um, but I don't think we should, uh, I, I can't be, I can't accept that as the, the end result. Because to me, I, I want to live in a world and I want my grandchildren to live in a world where we're not exploiting each other where we're not controlling resources so that some of us have a lot more. And even if it's a bigger, a number of us have a lot more, there's, I don't want a place where I have more because somebody else has less. I don't want a zero sum game. I don't want a limited pie. I believe in what, what one of my colleagues calls uh, economics of abundance. I believe that there's enough for everybody. It's how we structure it and who has access and voice and control. And I don't like this economics of scarcity. That's the other thing I should have said when I was explained mainstream economics. It's all about scarcity. There's small pie. We have to figure out how to dole out this small little bit. And there's nothing about growing the pie or nothing about abundance. There's nothing about everybody participating and benefiting. Um, but I come from a world and a worldview that we all should participate, we all should benefit. What we do should be helping not just ourselves and our families, but our neighbors and the world. It should be making sure that we can live those seven generations that some of the First Nations talk about in a way where we're all prosperous. It's about getting rid of poverty, homelessness, malnutrition, Right. Um, and the only way I know to do that is for all of us to work together, to do it together. Um, I really believe in stewardship, not ownership, but I'm willing to believe in cooperative collective ownership as the path to stewardship. Right. To get us away from private property and all that. And, you know, I'm sure in my lifetime I won't see us at stewardship, but at least maybe we can be on that path at least eliminate some of the private property and private ownership where some people get to take the marbles and go and do what they want with them. Um, so that's, I don't know if that ex gives you, uh, it's not exactly a scientific or an economic answer, but it's an answer from my heart <laughs> about what, you know, how I really think our economy should work and how we should relate to each other. And to me, that really is, we should all be, we are, and we should all, be treated as equals, we should all have equal access and equal outcomes in economic 
and social forces, and we should all be doing things to make the world better for all of us in whatever ways we can, especially through our economic structures, because that undermine, underpins everything. So now I'm a Pollyanna, but I'm sorry, that's who I am. <laughs> all right, we have some people raising their hands. Um, okay. I, I guess we'll start with Deidre Somerville. I'm gonna unmute you and you can ask your question. And, okay. Hello everyone. Um, Hi. Uh, Jessica, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you when you came to Chicago. Uh, actually, I think every time you came to Chicago in the last like three years. So it's good to see you again. Um, I've been um, struggling with this idea of how to, um, I've been involved with some of the cooperative uh, groups, the uh, study group uh, that's uh, been formed on the South Side since you're coming. Uh, your book was the first book we used as a study tool, uh, and it's an ongoing study group. Um, and it's, And now we're morphing into something from study to engage it in action um, intentionally that way um, and but my question actually is about uh, just some of my what I'm trying to learn about how this co-op question is not uh, it's not one-dimensional it's likely or potentially uh, multi-dimensional multi-tiered in terms of how people engage in cooperative uh, practice and I've been wanting to learn more about it too, Susan. So when you brought it up, I, I, my ears perked up a little because I've been uh, studying them, uh, how they work, where they work, um, and some areas where they work really well for some communities, particularly some communities of color, they work traditionally well, um, but they're not, uh, they're, they're very different from cooperatives in the sense that, we're, that we think of worker cooperatives and other like structures, but they're very cooperative in nature. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to get your your thoughts around how something like the the education and organizing around uh, expansion of Isuzu or in different ways, because there are different types of Isuzu. We think about the one where people share with money, but there could be other ways we could share in time, other ways we can maybe implement whether the idea of Isuzu. Um, uh, what do you think about that as one of the ways we can approach cooperative practice in general, for particularly for communities of color that are maybe not traditionally um, attuned to the SUSU movement as in, like, say, the Haitian community or the Latino community? Right, yeah, another good question. Um, I would say a couple things. You know, when I first started the project, I thought I was focusing on sort of official incorporated cooperatives because right. the first problem I was looking at was the co-op world that I got interested in wasn't talking about black co-ops and there must be some actual official black co-ops. That's how I started. However, somewhere in the middle, partly because um, even W.E. Du Bois, who was sort of my guru on this, when he was writing, he wasn't just writing it. He, his whole book was actually economic cooperation among Negro right. Americans, right? He didn't, right. right? Some of his were co-ops, but a lot of it was economic cooperation. That's where I got the mutual aid stuff. So I suddenly realized, right, right it wasn't really just that it had to be a co-op, but economic cooperation in some format, some kind of collectivism, collective ownership, but collective decision making, right? Then I also started learning more about solidarity economies and the solidarity economy movement. And I realized that was also what I was thinking right so again it doesn't and that's where you know i'm really a heterodox economist i'm not worried so much about the form except that the form needs to follow the values right yeah. right so to me it's really those values that's why i go, keep going back to the solidarity values because those are the ones that really make sure it's grassroots people in control for themselves doing some being economic agents of some kind with other people for the betterment of other of all of us or at least for their you know their group and then for all of us um, and so yeah I don't I'm not really that worried I mean I think ownership is important because as I said it's a way to you know broad ownership is a way to stewardship but even with the collectives and stuff 
I am more excited and about that collective power, right? Being right. cooperative and collective about power and decisions and that kind of thing. So it doesn't have to be a very specific structure. One of the things I actually liked about co-ops when I started learning about it on my own is they're actually not that rigid. I mean, some of the right. co-op world and some of the traditional cooperatives make it very rigid, and some of the co-op laws that we have, <coughs> excuse me, make it rigid. But actually, the model itself is so flexible that we can talk about mutual aid. We can talk about uh, peep shows and women sex workers having co-ops, right, and owning a co-op with the bouncers, right? I mean, there's just so many different forms. So I really try to tell people, to me, let's make sure we understand what, all the, what the value base is, and then whatever we do, if it reflects those values, it doesn't really matter which exact form or structure or shape it takes, but it's got to adhere to some of the values. <coughs> Sorry, I forgot to keep, get water near me. Um, Thank so you. I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, so that, that's how I think more and more. It's really, let's think about values-driven economic, social relations that really give us all power, equality, equity, and um, connect us to bettering our, com our community. Cad, well, you said there were more people? Yes, um, Laurie Simons. <laughs> We I'm just gonna... have about 10 minutes left. Okay. Okay, I think I just unmuted. Hi, this has been really delightful to hear, to hear from you, and um, I love your wealth of knowledge that you're sharing with Thank us. Thank you. Um, I have some pretty basic questions, and they have to do with, uh, are the number of co-ops in the United States, is it growing? Is there a surge? Um, so that's my first question. And the second question is, how do co-ops address issues of racism? Okay, two more big qu questions. <laughs> so, um, there is a surge in worker co-op ownership and <coughs> co-ops in the United States. The United States is a really weird animal because in some ways, we have a lot, a lot of co-ops. I forget what the number was. The NCBA, National Cooperative Business, Business Association, keeps track. I think there were 30,000 or something. Anyway, I was surprised the year that I went to the International Cooperative Alliance meeting. The United States is one of the countries that has the most votes because the votes are based on how many co-ops are in the National Trade Association. Wow. It's because we're such a big industrial country that we actually have a lot of co-ops, but we don't have a lot of co-ops per capita, I guess, which is interesting. So like even Canada, France actually has one of the highest per capita. I think Italy does. Um, I forget what the other countries are, but they actually don't have as big a vote in the ICA as us. So it's a weird combination. And then the U.S. was way behind on worker co-ops. We had ag co-ops and electric. We also have, I think, the rural electrics might be one of the reasons why we have so many, because they're able to count each one individually. Um, so in some ways, we have this huge co-op movement, but it's really un, unmanaged, untamed, unknown, not known well about, and it doesn't make a strong co-op movement. It's also a very conservative co-op movement. Um, because it's focused on the ag co-ops who are really, unfortunately, and I guess I shouldn't say this in public, but are not, you know, they're not solidarity economy. I guess I said that already, so I can keep saying that part. Um, so the U.S. is in this weird place where we actually have a lot of co-ops, and we have a lot of credit unions, right? But people don't think of the things that they're in as co-ops because they don't actually participate in them as co-ops, but they are co-ops. So we have a lot, but we're growing in the worker co-op movement, especially among Latinas. Latin American women in the United States are creating co -op, worker co-ops very fast in, in the United States. And then food co-ops, though that's slowing down now, but for the last, right around the Great Recession and stuff, the food co-op movement was really growing also and had lots of supports. At the same time, the ag co-ops and the rural electrics are actually reducing, especially the ag co-ops. 
in US and Canada, they've been uh, downsized and uh, demutualized and that kind of stuff. So they have a slower movement. I've been mostly in the worker co-op movement and it's been really exciting to see the growth, more young people, more people of color in that movement. Um, but there's still the tensions and the struggles between whether you're just trying to provide a better workplace or whether you're really trying to create a solidarity transformative business. Right. So that's the interesting thing there. Um, did that answer your question about size? Yeah. And then, oh shoot. Racism. Oh, racism. <laughs> <laughs> that's another one that could be a two hour lecture. Yeah. Um, so we live in an extremely racial and polar, racially polarized society and co-ops reflect that. Um, so even though co-ops, you know, we think of ourselves as being more progressive, co-op people are more progressive, co-ops allow for more participation and that kind of thing. There's still huge issues about racism um, in co-ops. Some of it is getting less. Like when I first started going to co-op conferences and meetings, there were almost no blacks and Latinos at the meetings involved at all. Now that's changing little by little. It was a slow, hard uh, progress. I mean, people used to look at me when I asked about it and they're like, oh, well, I don't know. I guess black people don't do co-ops, you know things like that. So there was a lot of miscommunication, misunderstanding and lack of support for co-op development among people of color and lack of recognition of the co-ops that existed. That is getting better. But because we're in such a polarized, racialized world and country in particular, you can't get rid of it. So there's still racial tensions and racial oppression within co-ops though a lot of the co-ops are trying to address that. There's also still some polarization. A lot of co-ops don't have people of color, or don't have blacks. Even some of the Latino co-ops don't really have black people in them. So there's tensions there, because unfortunately uh, a lot of Latino populations have been taught to be racist from the places where they come or even from the US when they get here. They've been taught that they're a different shade and a different history and relationship than African Americans and they don't want to be like us. So there's all these um, unspoken things that I, I mean, I shouldn't even have said that, but unspoken things that get caught up. Um, I was in a group once that didn't want the mission of the organization to be about people of color or something because they thought that was demeaning and that was making too much attention on not being mainstream and they just wanted to focus on making a happy world or something. I mean, so there's all kinds of stuff. I had a call from a student once at University of Pennsylvania of all places. She was gonna write her master's thesis on racism in co-ops. And her whole faculty told her there was no such thing, that co-ops didn't have racism. But she saw something that I had written online and so she emailed me because she was so confused and she couldn't understand why they were rejecting her topic. Um, finally, she, I told her she had to just find one faculty member <laughs> who believed her that there was a racism issue in co-ops and get that person on board. And um, so she did that and she said she was able to go move forward with her master's thesis. So, um, and the last thing I'll say, I see my buddy here is here to close us out. Um, <laughs> the last thing I'll say is, uh, but I have had some interesting things like the National Co-op Grocers, that's the Co-op Grocers uh, Tra National Trade Association. They actually met with me a couple of times about this issue, how the food co-ops could be less racist, could connect better with racial communities, could um, engage in black and Latino communities and uh, have branches there and stuff. And we talked about this issue and the need for more materials and for more anti-oppression work and stuff. And they actually put together a piece where they interviewed a lot of people about racism and co-ops and put together a little booklet. I forget what the name of it is. Um, but anyway, but that was a real attempt to kind of start to talk, at least talk about the issues. 
I don't know that we have them solved, but we have groups like Aorta, which is a worker collective that does anti-oppression training, um, not just racial, but I think they do sexual orientation, sexual gender inequality also. So we've, we've got movement happening. We've got more and more people interested in talking about it. Um, and a lot of the interest I've had for my book on black co-ops was white groups who realized they had to connect to people of color better and wanted me to come in and talk about my history and my work and the history that I did so that they could then start conversations with people of color about co-ops and that kind of thing. So there's definitely seems to be more a growing movement, at least awareness that it needs to be talked about and then trying to figure out how to be more uh, culturally sensitive and think about uh, non-exploitation, non, -exploitation, non uh, anti-oppression work within a co-op that just being a co-op doesn't solve it you have to be proactive and deliberate about uh getting rid of it thank you so we got one more question if we can squeeze it in um it's gonna have to be very short because uh okay ask the question and i'll give a one or two sentence answer <laughs> okay um ty you can go ahead Hi, uh, yeah. Can can you hear all right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Ty. Um, I'm based in Baltimore, um, out of town right now, but I'm working with a small group of CPAs and accountants there. So maybe about five, six of us now. Um, we're kind of coming together around some co common values um, uh, that are pro-Black, pro-Indigenous, and pro-ecology, among other things, right? So we're trying to tie um, a lot of things into what's bringing us together. Uh, right now, we're just sort of a referral network of accountants, and we're trying to gradually move to a place um, where we can basically incorporate as a worker cooperative. Um, and so what I'm kind of trying to think about now is what does it take to get some high-income um, Black professionals to start thinking about why it's in their interest to organize cooperatively. And so uh, where I'm at right now is I think it makes sense for them um, if for them it's kind of like a part-time thing, right? They come some of their work that they're they're already doing, they then do um, kind of on a part-time basis through this uh, cooperative institution. But um, I do think that this type of service could be beneficial to the broader solidarity economy, but I'm trying to think about you know, how do I keep these people who are already making a lot of money um, focused on not only our values, but what they can get out of um, being organized cooperatively? So if, if you have some thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, and I only have, I promised two sentences, right? Um, so the first thing I would say is to connect with them about um, the work life, right? Being um, in a worker cooperative maybe will give them more time with their family, right? More control over the work rules and their time. I mean, I know they're already professionals, but, um, you know, working as a collective could, you know, there's a great um, accounting co-op in Cuba that we visited when I was there. And they just felt like they had so much more control over their work and their work product and the time and to have other people, other professionals sharing and working with them just made a huge difference. They were also making more money than not in the co-op. I'm not sure that's the case in the US. Um, but anyway, that, so thinking about the, the values of what li work life would be and you know maybe not having to work on Sundays and Saturdays or getting to choose which Sundays and Saturdays you work, that kind of thing. So I think that would be one piece of it. I originally thought you were gonna ask me about how to get them to support um, uh, you know, work, pro bono work to help other black worker co-ops with their accounting and that kind of thing. And I was just gonna say that you, know, you could appeal to their, their politics, right? Their sense of social justice, that this is a way to make the world a little more just, a little bit better, and they can contribute either through their profession or through um their donation of their work that kind of thing but i think it, it does have to be at the values level right because they may not make more money but they might have a better quality of life 
Um, they might be able to contribute to other people's better quality of life. Um, and so that might be a way to do it. I mean, we could talk, uh, if you email, what is it, editors at geo, because other geo people probably have a lot of ideas too, and we've got a good base of people in Baltimore that maybe you could hook up with if you don't know them. Um, but I bet we could think of some, you know, and get them to come to a conference or hold a little mini conference with them. There's a bunch of different things we could do to sort of get them excited, maybe about the whole movement and about the role they could play. A bunch of us need good accountants. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so it seems like there's a way you could kind of draw them into this whole thing. Um, but I think I'm yeah. out of time. Yeah, it's, it's great. I'm sorry that we need to close it, but we're in the uh, middle of our winter work retreat and the New York City group here has to be someplace in about 20 minutes. So, and that includes Jessica. Otherwise, <laughs> So, no, we said uh, 4 to 5.30, so <laughs> we started on time and we're ending on time. Um, I want to thank everyone who came. It was just wonderful. The questions that were coming in were great. Um, and a, a request is uh, if you give us feedback, you have the chat, you can make the, uh, you know, the chats after, uh, after we leave or you can email, but we would love suggestions, negative feedback, positive feedback too you don't have you can give us all the positive feedback you want as well and this is an experiment and we want to see if we want to use this kind of a, of a platform for exploring a lot of other things in the corporate solidarity world so uh everybody from geo says thank you oh don't forget subscribe to geo how easy is it easy right josh how do you subscribe to geo so you can go to our website at geo.coop, that's G-E-O dot C-O-O-P, and just on the right-hand sidebar, um, if you're on a desktop computer or down at the bottom of the screen, if you're on your phone, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, very easy, just name and email address, comes out once a week. Um, and for any feedback or any, if you, anybody wants to get in contact with us, the email address is editors at geo.coop. Um, and, and I actually plural. have information. Editors. Editors with an S. Editors. Geo.coop, right. Yep. And subscribing is free, but of course we do want you to be a donor. We're in the middle of a drive for, what is it, $1 a month? Anyway, go to our website. Okay. Sorry, okay. Josh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. No, I should have muted myself. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you okay. weren't finished. So we thank you again, and uh, give us all the feedback you can so we can develop this idea, and uh, have a wonderful Martin Luther King weekend and celebration. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah.